Okay. Uh, first, I wish to thank the organizers for asking me to come here and give this talk. <clears throat> well, uh, we have heard this talk about dark matter this morning from Paolo. It is nicely summarized. There is overwhelming evidence for dark matter on various scales. Uh, but yet, there are some uh, long-lasting uh, problems, uh, problems, I won't say problems, some issues that are not quite understood. Paolo also passingly mentioned that briefly. Uh, but of late, uh, this has attracted some uh, renewed interest uh, because of availability of more data and uh, <clears throat> Uh, so things are uh, coming to sharper focus. So it may be time to actually start thinking about uh, these issues, which I'll... Uh, the basic uh, 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 observationally what is known is that there is mass discrepancy. Okay, that is, uh, you see more mass in the universe than uh, you you measure more mass in the universe than you see uh, in terms of luminous uh, matter. Um, so, as I said, mass discrepancy measurements have a long history going back to, uh, in fact, the, even before the work, there was another OPIC also measured uh, uh, masses, masses, but uh, in 1932, uh, Jan Wort, the uh, Dutch astronomer, uh, he uh, studied uh, the vertical motion of stars uh, on the disk of the galaxy. See, although we know that our galaxy, for example, is a spiral galaxy, the stars have a systematic rotatory motion. Uh, yet, there are peculiar velocities for them, they go up and down like this. And if you can study the kinematics of this, you can deduce how much mass is there on the disk of the galaxy. <clears throat> so, he used uh, this, by the way, his methods are still used nowadays to find out how much, what is the surface density of mass on the disk of the galaxy. Uh, he deduced from his calculations and that there should be some amount of invisible mass that is in order to explain the kinematics of the up and down motions of the stars. At that time, that amounted to about, in the modern units, about 2 GeV per cc. Uh, modern value of mass density of so-called dark matter is about 0.3 GeV per cc at the sun's location. But then he was not probably, see, his, uh, at that time, the instruments were not very good. He was probably, uh, referring to objects that were too faint to see by that invisible uh, mass. Uh, even though they are baryonic matter, but just too faint to see. Uh, but the real uh, discovery, so to say, of dark matter is often attributed to uh, 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 Fritz Zwicky. Uh, uh, John Ellis also mentioned this in his uh, talk. Uh, he did something uh, interesting. Uh, he, you see, in astronomy, mass and distance measurements are very difficult. Uh, you don't have direct, all you see is light from the objects. And so distance is one problem and the mass is the other problem. Uh, if you know the distance well, you can measure the mass because from the apparent luminosity, you can just uh, multiply by 4 by t square and get the absolute uh, magnitude. Anyway, uh, uh, he studied this object called Coma Cluster of Galaxies. This is a cluster of about thousand galaxies gravitationally bound uh, uh, in a cluster. Uh, it's about 100 megaparsec away. It has a total mass of about uh, 10 to the 14 solar mass. He used this virial theorem. That is, he assumed that this object is in some kind of virial equilibrium. That is basically two times the net kind of kinetic energy of the random motion of these galaxies inside these clusters of galaxies cluster of galaxies is uh, roughly the self-gravitating potential energy in the uh, system. So, uh, if, and he, you measure this thing, V squared, that is, you just measure the random velocities of these 
galaxies in this cluster and form the velocity dispersion of this. And this is by virial theorem directly related to the total mass contained within this uh, uh, system by uh, this uh, relation. R is some measure of the uh, uh, size of this uh, object. Uh, he measured uh, rotation, uh, the random speeds of the order of 1000 kilometer per second uh, and used this relation and derived that the mass of the coma cluster is about 400 times the mass of the visible, that is, uh, matter in this cluster in, the, in terms of galaxies. That is the radial velocities of particles in the coma cluster are too large for galaxies to be bound uh, within uh, this cluster. Uh, note that Zwicky actually used the wrong value of the Hubble constant. That was as measured by Hubble, that was wrong. Uh, current value we know is about eight times less. Uh, and so that's why uh, he got a rather large number. But still, if you use the correct value, it's about 50 times. Uh, the, uh, so that was at the level of cluster. There is a mass discrepancy, okay, what you see and what you measure. But the mass discrepancy at the level of uh, on the galactic scales uh, started beginning to be studied only uh, uh, in you know uh, late 60s and early uh, 70s, primarily due to systematic work in, uh, done by Vera Rubin and her collaborators. She recently passed away, uh, uh, and uh, she uh, systematically measured the so-called rotation curves. That is. Uh, of spiral galaxies, the rotation speeds are the function of galactocentric uh, distance. So, uh, this is all. And this is very important thing because this is directly related to the mass contained within radius r. So, if you measure this at an r, you get an estimate of the mass contained within that, and that's how you can measure the mass also. So, it's a very, very important. Uh, Thing in all galactic dynamics and dark matter studies to calculate, measure the rotation curve very carefully. And I, in my talk also, I'll subsequently uh, spend a little bit of time on this because the, what I want to talk about is mainly to do with the galaxies, okay? And where the rotation curve plays a very important role. So uh, this is, for example, the rotation curve uh, in around 1985 measurements. You see there are a lot of errors, but it's more or less what people call a flat rotation curve, a flat. Uh, but note that this was at that time going up to only around a disk of some okay, 14, 15, maybe 20 kiloparsec from the center of the galaxies. Only recently it is beginning to be the rotation curve is being extended to very, very large distances. And I'll talk about that. Okay, I have to go to the other and I'll come to that. And this is being used. So, in the galaxies, the picture that one forms to, oh, so by the way, so but this mass discrepancy comes because the typically the observed rotation curve sometimes even rises, goes, and what you expect is this. This is known to uh, most people. I'm just uh, uh, clearing the ground for later discussion. So, you have to provide additional mass to support this additional, uh, the higher uh, rotation speeds, and that is the mass discrepancy. On dark matter is one way of explaining this. So the picture one has is that our galaxy, spiral galaxy, visible matter is a tiny little thing sitting in the center of a so-called halo of dark matter. This is a theorist's picture, okay, uh, uh, dark matter. Uh, we don't quite know how far it extends and what this is made up of and other properties of it, but you can make models, okay? So typically, in order to fit the rotation curve, so the total gravitational potential is that due to this visible matter, which you can model by uh, appropriate means, and that of the dark matter. So the potentials will add and the velocities, uh, rotation speeds will add in uh, quadrature because uh, from uh, here. So you can calculate the various components due to contribution of this visible matter. Visible matter, again, is made up of a bulge of the galaxy. There's a disk of the galaxy. And then you have the halo. If you add up, in principle, you can explain the observed rotation curve to very large distances, okay, by appropriately choosing the model. So that's, this is called mass modeling, okay, of our galaxy. Thereby, you can determine how much visible matter is there. So for example, here, 
So this is this is the visible matter contribution. Clearly, it fails to explain the rotation curve by itself. And here is the dark matter initially lying low, but then it rears its head and it eventually dominates and explain so this is the total uh, nicely. So this is the uh, aim. Mass discrepancy is not just at a level of galaxies and clusters, but even at larger and larger, uh, generally mass to luminosity ratio in the universe increases, okay, as you go to larger and larger distance. So it's ubiquitous, the uh, uh, mass discrepancy. Now I come to the today's uh, talk. Uh, uh, last year, uh, so there was this paper which came out in PRL called Radial Acceleration Relation in Rotationally Supported Galaxies by his background and uh, collaborators. Um, I just copied the, uh, so we report a correlation between the radial acceleration traced by rotation curves and that predicted by the observed distribution of baryons. That's what people have been doing uh, all the while. The same relation is followed by 2693 points in 153 galaxies. These galaxies are of various different types. He has collected together the latest data with very different morphologies, masses, sizes, and gas fraction. And there's a, this correlation persists even when dark matter dominates. Consequently, the dark matter contribution is fully specified by that of baryons. Because if there is a relationship between the two, if you know the baryons, you can predict what the dark matter, uh, essentially what should be the rotation curve. The observed scatter is small and largely dominated by observational uncertainties. And then he adds, this radial acceleration relation is tantamount to a natural law for rotating galaxies. This has severe, lots of implications. This is probably his mind, something like modification of gravity and all these things. But so uh, uh, this is added here. But this is the stage. Now uh, explain what exactly they have done. Well, this is their sample of galaxies. You see, so these are widely different set of luminosities and surface densities, okay, of these various galaxies. Uh, they, this is called a sample called Spark uh, sample of uh, galaxies. And here are what are plotted is three completely different, uh, for an example, out of these uh, total, all these galaxies. Each point is a galaxy here. Uh, so, uh, so, for example, this is a bulge dominated uh, uh, spiral galaxy. In other words, the peak of the rotation curve is explained by the, the bulge component of the spiral, the central bulge component. Okay? Uh, but the rotation curve is going high, and this is the total baryonic contribution. But the peak is essentially explained by the bulge. Uh, here is another galaxy called disk dominated galaxy. Okay? Uh, here, the disk is the main. Uh, contributed to the total uh, luminous mass of the galaxy. Here is a gas dominated dwarf, okay, that doesn't even, it is dominated by essentially not many stars, just gas. So its visible matter contribution is very, very low, okay, but this is the rotation. Yet, for this galaxy, you plot from this observed uh, rotation speeds, as I said, you can just, is a V square by R, so V is measured. And at a r, b square by r will directly give you the gravitational acceleration, g. So this is g observed is plotted this way. And g baryons, you know, the baryon contribution due to the known model uh, baryon mass in the universe. If you plot this, then you see the observed is by this. So at very uh, large, towards the, so in this figure, as you go this way, you go towards the center of the galaxy. As you go towards this way. Accelerations become low and low, you go towards the outer edge of the galaxy. So, in the central parts of the galaxy, the total acceleration is essentially that due to the baryons. But as you go to lower uh, acceleration regions, it departs from this line and this. So, this is for all individual galaxies, but when uh, he, uh, the, the McGough et al collect these data together for all these 153 galaxies and various points along these galaxies rotation curves, they find this systematic, that is the, observe, the baryonic uh, acceleration due to the baryonic matter, which is known, and acceleration measured from the rotation curve, okay, uh, have uh, lie on 
this kind of a thing. And then uh, they fit this with a relation like this. Now, this is pulled out of the hat or somewhere. It's uh, why this, but it turns out that these kind of relations are, have bearing on the bond. We'll come back to that. But uh, he says, if you have this kind of a relation, it perfectly fits this. There are the scatter, they are saying, is very small. Okay? So, uh, and in this relation, there is a characteristic acceleration scale in the problem. Okay? And that's about 1.2 times 10 to the minus 10 meter per second square. <clears throat> Uh, basically, that's where, that's the acceleration scale where there is a departure from uh, the observed, the, the observed and the baryonic uh, acceleration. So, the mass discrepancy, hence dark matter, are strongly sort of anti-correlated with visible matter. That is where visible matter is more, we don't need to have too much dark matter, but where visible matter has fallen to very negligible level, dark matter has risen. and to in such a way that the rotation curve is essentially kept flat. So why is it that the rotation curve, or the, that's I think the question, why, who uh, made uh, the spiral galaxies such that uh, there is this relationship? So this basically says that the MD, or if it is dark matter, is essentially determined by visible matter. It predicts, if you know the visible matter, you can tell the, what the rotation curve will be. So, uh, this has uh, raised some uh, interesting and lots of people are uh, interested why uh, it be so. Uh, so, uh, one uh, thing to check is whether the CDM simulation, cold dark matter simulations can reproduce this. Now, cold dark matter simulations have earlier uh, been so far only dark matter uh, simulations. But because uh, it's very hard to put in all the complex baryonic physics, but of late, there have been increasingly uh, good simulation, including uh, uh, baryon, baryon physics, hydrodynamic simulations. So, but still they cannot capture all the aspects of basic uh, But nevertheless, here I show one very recent result. It's uh, three months ago from here. They have done a big uh, uh, CDM simulations. They say that in CDM, dark matter also reproduces this, but the, their form, this exact relationship is rather different from what McGuff et al. showed in that. Uh, so it's probably, they say that it's kind of universal for so many galaxies, probably not, but this is from their simulation. Nevertheless, they have some kind of correlation here, but they can't explain why it is so. It's a simulation, it comes out of the calculation, very difficult to say, um, but it is there. Claim it. So, question is, this was for a wide uh, variety of uh, galaxies. Now, when you come to individual galaxies, how does this relationship uh, uh, hold? So, uh, since I, have, uh, I had some interest in the Milky Way for uh, quite some time and its dynamics, uh, I thought we'd look into it. <clears throat> just beginning to uh, uh, look into this uh, question. So, mass discrepancy excellent relation for our own uh, Milky Way. In order to do that, uh, we need to have a very precise, a good uh, rotation curve of our uh, Milky Way. Uh, so, again, I remind you, rotation curve is related to this. So, you can, if you measure this, you can calculate the acceleration. For a particle in a circular orbit, the rotation curve is, uh, uh, can be calculated uh, uh, easily. Uh, so, it looks like if you measure BCR, you get total MR, uh, but things are not so simple because the rotation curve itself is uh, something very difficult to measure because stars on the disk have approximately circular orbits, but the stars beyond the disk. See, all these uh, so far studies restrict themselves to about 20 kiloparsecs, that is within the disk of the galaxies, but the rotation curve extends to even uh, far away distances. Uh, they have non circular orbits. Also, there are not many tracer stars beyond the disk. So, you use 21 centimeter line emission from the atomic hydrogen as tracers, but even that gets very, very 
uh, uh, hard to uh, get. So data become sparse as you go to uh, larger and larger uh, distance. Also, you only actually measure the line of sight component of the velocity from here. You don't directly get the rotation, uh, rotational uh, motion. So you have to do modeling and various kinds of uh, 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 processing before you arrive at this VC. Whereas the VCR is not a directly measured quantity, it has to be reconstructed from the line of sight velocity data. Now, uh, um, some years ago, some three, four years ago, not being trained as an astronomer, decided because we are getting fed up with only seeing the rotation curve up to about 30 kiloparsec, maybe 40 kiloparsec. So we decided, we, I, I just wanted to learn how people reconstruct the rotation curve. And in that process, together with my students, uh, we were successful in extending the rotation curve all the way out to about 200 kiloparsec by using some various kinds of tracers uh, in the uh, uh, galaxy. So you can actually see this is an adver advertisement for this work also because this also gives yeah. useful, I think, you will find the machine readable form data for the entire rotation curve. So if you want to use it for some work, you can find it here for the rotation curve. Uh, just a little bit of details about how actually the, you set up the coordinates and these are the various tracers. You use various methods. I won't go bore you with the, only to mention that for the two different methods are used. For the disk stars, it's relatively uh, uh, easy to calculate. So rotation speed at a distance r is related to this uh, uh, co galactic coordinates, L of B of the tracers, and this something called VLSR, that is local standard of rest, because we are moving along with the sun, but you want to measure the rotation speeds with respect to the galactic center, so you have to do some transformations, so you have to find what the local standard of rest is. Our sun itself has some motion, okay, uh, in the disk, and so you put all these things and uh, you can calculate using such a formula. Uh, but as you go beyond the disk of the galaxy, uh, there is no circular motion, okay? There are uh, random motion, some orb, uh, orb tracers have random motion or highly elliptic orbits. So you use what is called Jin's equation. It is basically relates, uh, Jin's equation is basically various moments of the phase space distribution function of these uh, stars uh, or, the, or the objects in the galaxy. So the second moment of the velocities uh, get uh, related, the, the circular velocity can be uh, expressed in terms of this uh, velocity dispersion of uh, the tracer objects in the sky. N tracer is the number density of the uh, tracer population and their radial profile. So, and beta here is the uh, velocity anisotropy of these tracer objects. That is uh, whether the objects are mostly moving radial directions or the tangential direction. If they're isotropic, they would be, so beta would be equal to uh, zero. If they're absolutely radially uh, anisotropic, beta would be one. We don't, uh, uh, so this has to be measured and so actually rotation curve depends also on these tracers. Uh, so some modeling has to be done. So it's a bit uh, non-trivial. So this, for example, is the rotation curve on the disk of the galaxy. These are a wide variety of samples of these tracers that we use and uh, do some proper weighted averaging methods and all this. And finally, uh, this, is, this is reasonably flat. But interesting thing is it depends also on what is the distance from the galaxy center to sun, which is unknown, where there is some uncertainty. And also what is the local uh, VLSR, that is what is the uh, rotation speed at sun's location. It, there is some uncertainty in this. So depending on these quantities, your rotation curve will also uh, differ uh, somewhat. Beyond the disk, also, uh, you can use a wide variety of uh, samples of stars, for example, these are called blue horizontal branch stars, okay? There's a K giant star, all these, uh, I won't go into the details. So these are available, you have to dig out all these uh, things and collect them together, get the samples, and using this Jin's equation now, you can reconstruct the rotation curve for these various different samples, and then we'll collapse the samples by some weighted average method. So for example, you see this rotation curve goes to like this. It's just falling, it's not flat. Yeah. So uh, 
this is the sort of grand uh, rotation curve combining everything from all the way to central regions all the way out to very large distance. See lots of uh, data put in. These are for three different values of the local standard of rest, okay, for uh, radial anisotropy. But you have this data. This is the rotation curve, actual rotation curve data to large distances. Once you get the rotation curve, you can measure what is the mass of the galaxy on within a certain radius r, basically uh, v square over g. You can form this. So, mass of the galaxy goes close to about total mass. This is from the rotation curve. So, it gives about close to uh, 10 to the 12, okay, solar mass, okay. So, we know that the visible matter is about 10 to the 11 solar mass. So, it's a 10 time more mass discrepancy or dark matter in the uh, galaxy, roughly. Uh, these are, you can reconstruct the, for various different dark matter profiles of the, and fit to the rotation curve. What is the baryonic content? What is the dark matter content for each given dark matter profile? You can fit all these things and uh, do your uh, analysis, uh, whatever you like. This is the density profile of uh, the dark matter as well as visible matter, okay. Uh, so, for example, this uh, so called uh, you can reconstruct just by fitting the rotation curve data. This is the total mass uh, profile for these are all our Milky Way uh, galaxy. So, uh, from the rotation curve. So, uh, with that rotation curve, I can now calculate what is the if there is such a relation in our galaxy. Actually, I was doing this just here for the last two days. I had this data, but so from this I read off and calculated with a simple calculator, it calculates the g's, and you can plot this. So, this, for example, this is one example I have to one particular uh, uh, dark matter profile that fits the rotation curve, namely the INASCO uh, profile, okay, and uh, read off this the best from the best fit rotation curve, uh, calculate the observed value of the uh, acceleration and baryonic content I know because this is the baryonic and plot it. This is for our Milky Way. And this uh, this is the McGough et al. paper. Uh, uh, they, I, I told you they suggested this relation fits their all universal uh, values with this to be characteristic this. I plot this, it doesn't actually describe the Milky Way properly. Okay. It goes reasonably well up to this. Then as you go to really low accelerations, by the way, I plot in centimeter per second square, they plot in like a meter per second square. So there's a factor of ten to two orders of magnitude shift. But uh, nevertheless, uh, as expected, go to very uh, towards the central region of Milky Way where visible matter dominates. Okay, the total observed is that explained by the visible matter, but as you depart, go outward, you start departing from this line, but McGough et al said that they should follow this, but they don't actually for visible way. I have to understand this yet, uh, study it in more detail, this is just a preliminary calculus. So what I am saying again is that these people, what they gave as a universal relation may not be true for individual galaxies, because what they did actually is not clear to me. So. Uh, this is the situation for uh, uh, mass distance. What is, this is the time remaining? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, it's about 200 seconds. Ah, in this plot, uh, sun location is deep within, so sun is probably somewhere. So, uh, just to provoke you to uh, thinking, uh, uh, when this McGuff et al, they, they at the base, back of their mind, they don't mention, they only at the last mention the MOND, but, uh, uh, but um, this fitting relation they mentioned, uh, in fact, after publication of this, uh, immediately there was a rejoinder from Milgram, who I'm coming, who is the originator of Mond. He said, this is basically Mond relation, and you have not mentioned anything about Mond, but 
is from one. So anyway, uh, 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 this relation uh, they have used. Uh, now, as I said, so I'll close in the next uh, mentioning about the modified Newtonian dynamics. That came, uh, the first paper uh, in 1983, uh, uh, oh no, sorry, this is before the, okay, let me go back. I'll come back to this. Uh, Milgram, in 1983, uh, while he was at the Institute of Advanced Study, uh, he wrote three papers uh, laying out what is now called MOND, a modification of the Newtonian dynamics as a possible alternative to the hidden mass hypothesis. He is suggesting that maybe there is no dark matter. Uh, I can explain the uh, rotation curve by modifying the Newton's law, uh, that is at the very low acceleration end, pi in, a, in an appropriate way, which we will come to that, uh, for accelerations below a certain characteristic acceleration. Note that uh, Milgram's, all other previous, uh, you know, the modification of gravity law have been there for many people come up with, uh, you know, uh, modification of inverse square law, you know, uh, additional uh, fifth force kind of thing, all these things. But he is suggesting something different. He is not as a distance uh, modification, but in terms of acceleration. There is a fundamental uh, acceleration he introduces. Uh, and his uh, modification uh, is, uh, again, I'll come back to this, of the following. So I have just reproduced from his uh, paper. I have considered the possibility that Newton's second law does not describe the motion of objects under the conditions which prevail in galaxies and systems of galaxies. Okay. In particular, I allowed for the inertia term not to be proportional to the acceleration of the object. So rather, what he modifies, so for a given force, the acceleration produced is if this is the A is the actual actual acceleration produced is not this, but there is a another modification term mu A over A naught. A naught is a fundamental constant, acceleration constant, as I say, about 1.2 in 10 to the power of this, such that this mu for X, A by A0, large. For large accelerations, this goes to unity, so you reproduce uh, the Newton's law. But for very low AX, this goes proportional to X, okay. So that's his modification. So here MG is the gravitational, so the force field is assumed to be this. So basically, Newton's acceleration, Newtonian gravity is nothing but the, some this mu times A, acceler inertial acceleration produced by uh, the force field. Uh, so, he proposes this uh, relation and then there are many possible forms of this mu x, so called, this is called an like interpolating function, okay, which has to interpolate between low x and uh, large x in a suitable way to fit the rotation curve. These are some examples used uh, by the Mond people, uh, form of the x. Uh, it was uh, immediately after this, it was realized by Milgram and Bekenstein and others that this actually violates uh, momentum and anti-momentum conservation and so they modified the Poisson's law also accordingly and uh, they then the detailed calculations show that uh, this is uh, all right, uh, energy conservation is uh, maintained. Note that for A very, very small compared to A0, this relation tells you, so you put X here, yeah, A over A0, so it becomes A squared is Newtonian gravity times this uh, uh, fundamental uh, acceleration. So, uh, it's like this and we, since A is, if you, if you consider a circular orbit, okay, in a motion circular uh, acceleration is this. So, you put that in that relation, you find a relationship between the circular speed, okay, and the total mass of the system. Now, this systematics was long, uh, known long time ago, what is called in 1977, two people, Tully and Fisher, wrote a very important paper, now it's called Tully-Fisher relationship. They seen, uh, observed relationship between, so this is the width of the line profile, for example, if it is 21 centimeters. So this is directly related to the rotation speed, circular uh, rotation speed, and the absolute magnitude, okay, that is the total luminosity, or 
the total luminous mass in the system. There is a nice uh, correlation. And this is simple, this can be translated to a relationship between the, the, the so called asymptotic flat uh, rotation speed and the baryonic mass in the system. Those are a nice tight uh, correlation. This is called Tully Fisher uh, relation. So, this relationship between rotation speeds, which gives you total mass, and the luminosity, which gives you the baryonic mass, okay, this is the relation. L should be proportional to rotation speed to the power 4. And in MOND, we precisely reproduce this for low uh, distances. So, uh, so, as I showed, P to the power 4 can be related to the total mass, okay. So, it can be total mass to, if the mass to luminosity ratio of in your entire Gaussian circle is constant, then it's related to the, this is exactly Tully Fisher. So, MOND was actually uh, 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 motivated by uh, Tully Fisher uh, uh, relation, uh, and uh, so uh, they, uh, this explains. Now, uh, clearly, uh, there have been many criticisms. Uh, that there is not yet any fully relativistic version of the theory on uh, is available yet. It has difficulties in explaining in dark matter or the mass dissipation in clusters of galaxies. Uh, McGuff claims that actually that is not so, but it's so detailed I couldn't understand. Uh, but uh, and then uh, bullet cluster. It's very hard to explain in terms of model. Cosmology, CMB, structure formation, are they, because you don't have a relativistic theory, you can't really uh, explain this in a proper way. So that, uh, so currently MOND is a kind of a phenomenological uh, uh, sort of model that tries to address this correlationship between the, the observed visible matter and the dark matter. How is it that the dark matter uh, distributes itself exactly in keeping with the baryonic matter? That is, so Mond says that I don't need dark matter, just the, because I modify the Newton's law and with the observed visible matter, we can explain this. But it's not clear how it do these things. Maybe in future, if you have a fully relativistic theory, one can do that. But currently, that's it. But the origin of MDAR, that is the mass discrepancy, acceleration relation in rotationally supported galaxies remains to be uh, explained. Actually, way back in 1986, this has been there for a long time. Uh, there seems to be a kind of conspiracy in, in the uh, galaxies. So, uh, Van Alvada and CCC wrote a very uh, interesting paper. So, they, for example, here say the luminous matter and dark matter seem to conspire to produce the flat observed rotation curves in the outer region. It seems unlikely that this coupling between disk and halo results from the large-scale gravitational interaction between the two components. Attempts to determine the shape of dark halos have not yet produced convincing results. It's an open issue. So some people have suggested there may be additional interaction, physical interaction between the dark matter particles and this to produce this observed. Uh, uh, relationship. So I end here by thanking you. This is, this uh, relationship is now for rotationally supported, this is spiral galaxies, but there is a similar relation in elliptical galaxies. That's called Faber-Jackson law. Okay, that is to do with the total mass of the elliptical galaxies is related to the velocity dispersion. Elliptical galaxies are not supported by rotation, but due to random motion of the uh, stars within the galaxy. So there also a similar relation is there, but uh, the, not this kind of such a tight relationship. This is only about rotational curves, but there are other evidence for dark matter. Like yeah, I told you, there is overwhelming evidence for, but on the, in the galaxies, the dark, evidence for dark matter comes from rotation. You have to explain this, whether, no, even if dark matter, CDM or whatever, this needs to be explained. But currently there is no, it's not clear what is the origin of this code.
More questions, John? So if we could come back to uh, the rotation curve of our own galaxy. Of our galaxy? Yeah. yeah. Uh, which one? Uh, for example, this. What you want? So how much do you believe in the existence of possible structures as a function of radius? I mean, is yeah. data seem to be going up and down? Yes. Down. It's Parsecs. Yes. It's more or less our distance. Yes. Center. People have suggested that there are rings, ring-like structures inside our galaxy. Uh, right, right. So that kind of uh, people have said, I have lost over this, but people who do the actual galactic uh, dynamics, they have to take it. So do you personally think there's any statistically significant evidence for ripples in that curve? Yes. This, this, this is not a more, almost everybody finds this. Yeah, there are like this, so there are dips, so the, these are there. One thing is that uh, if you, if when you make transition from bulge to the disk, you will see some change over. Very, very close to the disk. You see that. This is the bulge actually. Yes, yes. So, this has been suggested to be on the disk, there is a ring of material. Which, uh, uh, can it be interpreted as some clumping uh, as a result of summer field enhancement? Also, some curiosity. So, uh, around uh, 20, 25 uh, kiloparsecs. Yeah, so I'll go to that. Two things happen. One is, no, no, that's the so same plot. Yeah, if you, that you can see clearly if you also, go to the disk rotation. So there are two things I observe. One is, of course, there is uh, this gap. But the second is the error bars somehow seem to be going down. Can you just go on the, I can, uh, these are difficult for me to read. Go on the earlier slide and it may be easier for me to read. This one? No, the same slide that was, uh, ah, here, yeah. Uh, also, is it difficult for the scaling? You know, I have plotted in logarithmic. Uh, no, not, 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 not that scaling, but so just before that gap, you somehow seem to have some very large error bars, which might indicate uh, fainter stars. No, these are not what has happened is there are three different uh, uh, local standard of rest rotation curve is plotted for. So, yes. Uh, yeah, that's got to do with that sample, whatever. Uh, you have errors, yes. It has to do with the sample or does it have to do with some property of the Milky Way distribution of stars itself? Yeah, sample. Uh, no, the tracer sample that yeah. we use, okay, it will give these, all these errors uh, in the velocity comes from that. Okay. There are errors in the measurements of the velocities of this line of sight velocities of the uh, tracer. It does. I have the, I don't have the, we have, uh, it introduces a factor of about, uh, roughly about, so we calculated the dark matter density in the local neighborhood. So it goes from uh, 0.2 to 0.6, depending on which value of the local standard of rest you use. You use 8.0 and this 8.3, so a factor of three almost. Standard is some kind of ever in between you use. Yeah, but I, this is another thing that I wanted to uh, that there are these uncertainties. Even the even the dark matter density is uncertain by almost a factor of three. Yeah, so uh, Pierre Sakivi has been visiting CERN recently, and he uh, uh, brainwashed me that uh, he thinks that there is a sort of ring around. Uh, our radius in the galactic center, which would actually enhance. Cast, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's right, that's right. Which would enhance the density compared to conventional estimates. Uh, and it may be a factor of two, something like yeah. that. So, uh, warning is that people who use for dark matter uh, direct detection, you know, should keep that in mind. There is this uncertainty is there uh, until uh, this is fixed. It's uh, very curious that uh, we don't even know correctly. 
uh, see between 200 and 244. People are now converting towards this to be the local standard of rest. That is, our sun's location speed is 244 rather than 220. So that is the change. Okay, I'm all once more. Another curiosity: Is there any evidence for any anisotropy in different arms of our galaxy to show that? So perhaps the distribution of stars is different in different arms, or distribution of dark matter is different in different arms. So velocity, Not velocity of a function of distance. Yeah. Uh, uh, by anisotropy, you mean? So uh, DC velocity function of distance anisotropy? would be different along different directions along the disk of our galaxy. So in like visible that. part, of course, yes, no. Yes. So, but we are now talking about uh, velocity curves which are far away from the visible parts, which ah. perhaps would tell you whether you the distribution of dark matter in the galaxy have is, uh, right. uh, yeah. is uniform in all directions or not. So, radial uh, is because you are going very far away from the with respect to the galactic center. So, uh, what uh, anisotropy in the stellar distribution or velocity curve? Dark matter distribution. Huh? The dark matter distribution. Oh, dark matter? No, I can't observe. No, no, so no, no. Let me ask right. a very, very specific question. Let me see. You try to look at uh, velocities of stars, visible stars, uh, very far away. Let's say 30 kiloparsecs from the center of the galaxy. Yes. Okay. And you try to look at uh, these velocities at in different directions. So you go along different half of the galaxy. Do you see a significant variation between uh, Yes. Directions or not. Yes. This was that we have include. You see, this factor beta is the velocity and isotropy of the tracers that are used. You at a very large distances. Now again, this observationally, for example, so I, I'll tell you. But when you write beta equal to zero, does it mean it's observed factor? It's observed. No. Beta equal to no. Nobody knows. Beta can be between zero and one. Only recently there is a measurement. So So here is a curve about beta. Uh, this this is a paper we have taken from this Rashkov measurement. There is a radial dependence of this anisotropy of the tracers that we use in your Gilles equation to calculate the rotation speed. So people have modeled this is some Ossipov Merrill model. So beta is a function of r. Indeed, there is an anisotropy. So in fact, you show that the rotation curve is lowest for when beta equal to 1, that is completely radially anisotropic. If your tracers are moving almost radial directions, then you get the lowest rotation curve. Then from that, you get a lower limit on the total mass of the galaxy. Okay? And that comes out to be about 7 times 10 to the 11 is the lower limit. So from our rotation curve, we have set a lower limit. So there is an anisotropy after all. Yes. I think that was his question. Yes. The of that is my question. Tracers, visible tracers. Yeah. Oh, the dark matter halo could be an isotropic also. But that you only have to model because I can't have no direct observation. Okay, so maybe at this stage we can close this talk by thanking the speaker once more.